Hello everybody. I came to talk about stench and beauty. <laughs> about garbage and art. I came to talk about this mountain, which I agree is not the Everest, <laughs> <laughs> but it is a mountain that exists in Israel right in the center of the country. Approximately three quarters of a million cars pass by there every day. Now, it is approximately 80 meters high above sea level, and it's called Chiria. You would think it is a mountain because it rises up from the plain, but it's actually made out of 18 million tons of garbage. How was it created? Just by chance. <laughs> Somebody didn't like the smell of garbage near Tel Aviv and he thought I would throw my garbage away a little farther out. And then his neighbor thought the same. Till at the end, about a thousand trucks of garbage a day came there to be put and this is how the mountain grew. I was always amazed. How can it be that people, when they pass with their cars, close their windows in order not to suffer the smell? People were apathic to the mountain. And it was strange to me. It bothered me. How could it be that, for example, Paris has the Eiffel Tower? <laughs> New York has the Statue of Liberty. And what do we have in Israel? We have Chiria. <laughs> Every tourist entering the country, the first visiting card gets is a little smelly. It's this mountain. I retired as a museum curator and I thought what could I do to change, to recycle the image of this terrible environmental nightmare? Now what would you do? What can one do with such a thing? What would you do? Now I had at my disposal the fact that I had been a curator and I knew how to make exhibitions. So I thought, I'm going to try that. By that time, I had joined a foundation, the Blaha <coughs> Foundation, and they were willing to help. And I asked permission to go up and have a look at the mountain. Now, this was like a fortress with barbed wire around. It, was, it is a dangerous place. The slopes are very steep. There is gas inside. And I, they didn't allow anybody up, including me. So I thought, what could I do? So I asked the lift from a truck driver of a garbage truck. And he said to me, mate, you don't want to go up there. Your girlfriend won't take you to bed for two weeks. You'll be smelling so bad. <laughs> I decided to take the risk anyhow. <laughs> and I drove up and this is what I saw. It was like, it reminded me of medieval paintings of hell, the pictures of hell by Hieronymus Bosch. You couldn't imagine the terrible smell, the deafening sound of tens of thousands of birds, scavengers standing till the midriff in the garbage. And I quickly went down and I thought I have to do something about that. <coughs> I have to try to make this exhibition. Then I became lucky. Because what happened was that somehow the people who were in charge of the garbage mountain were told that they had to close the mountain. The danger of the birds was so big that it endangered the flight, the flight of the airplanes descending <coughs> Ben Gurion Airport. So those people hadn't thought ever about what to do with this environmental wound afterwards. 
So they thought, well, one of these artsy type, let's make this exhibition. And then I decided to invite 10 artists from abroad and 10 artists from Israel. We were given permit to go up the mountain. And we were up there on a Friday morning and they were frolicking around. They were throwing garbage at each other and they were having fun. <laughs> and apparently what happened was that the gatekeeper of this site thought that something strange was going on and for some reason or other he called the media. And in an hour and a half suddenly we saw two convoys of television crews coming up the mountain and they started interviewing the artists and asking them, what are you doing there? What is this all about? And before we even had to start the exhibition, we were on primetime news <laughs> by the evening. Now the exhibition itself, I asked Tel Aviv municipality to put a garbage truck on top of the Tel Aviv Museum, but I didn't get a permit, of course. <laughs> but the exhibition itself had very many interesting ideas. I only show you a few. This is an example of an artist who you wouldn't believe there is such a thing. She's an American artist and she is the artist in residence of the sanitation department of the city of New York. <laughs> there is such a thing. She is used to garbage and garbage sites, and she suggested that on top of Geria, we would make four geysers, one, two, three, four, and we would color them. And they would indicate the situation of the environment in Israel. So let's say, if there was a lot of air pollution, it would turn red. If the, the situation was better, and everything was clean, it would turn green. Another proposal, another one of the many <coughs> suggestions in the proposal was this one by an Israeli artist called Micha Ullman, who suggested uh, that we, we put, we hollow out the mountain and then we create, create a recycling center within it. Another suggestion was by a Chinese artist who lives in New York. His name is Tsai, and he became very well known because he creates works of art with firework. His suggestion was to explode the whole mountain. <laughs> <laughs> but I told him that explosions were not so popular in Israel. <laughs> so I asked him for something else, and he suggested that we make a big dinosaur out of stone on top of the plateau. And this, would, this would, dinosaur would create healing facilities. For example, if you would step on the head of the dinosaur and you had a headache, the headache would pass. <laughs> and he suggested also to put all kinds of medical plants around the mountain. Now, for artists to deal with such a huge project was nearly impossible. I mean, artists don't work on that scale. The biggest you could imagine is Mount Rushmore in America, for example. And also there were so many en engineering problems, like this gas well, for example. We, we drilled 60 wells uh, in order to get the gas out, and we now bring it out and bring it to a textile factory uh, where it creates their energy. By the time, by this time, I, we were a group of more people who were interested to help and to do things, and we started breaking our heads. So, who could actually make this, uh, make create this mountain into something that would express healing? It would express a return to nature, and of course, creating a park uh, is a cultural intervention. A culture, it creates like making a painting. You have a tableau rase if you fill it with colors and compositions and all kinds of things. So we decided that the best people to do this would be landscape architects. 
Now, landscape architects are a strange breed. <laughs> Most of the big parks in the world were made in the 19th century. The 20th century didn't see any creation of parks, or hardly any. And you will probably you know many famous names of artists and architects, but you wouldn't know names of landscape architects. Postmodernism changed that, and landscape architects came in before that. So then, again, we decided to make an an, a competition of landscape architects with proposals of what to do with the mountain, asking them to try to incorporate as many of the ideas that the artists had. This took place. We again had, we had a competition, we again had an exhibition in the Tel Aviv Museum, and everything seemed to go wonderfully. And then everything went wrong. How come? It appeared suddenly that we were not the only ones who were interested in doing something on the mountain and around. There were real estate people, who you would sometimes call real estate sharks, who wanted to build, and they were interested in creating 40,000 housing units, and they said, from the income of the housing units, we will help you to make a park. But this, of course, would kill the park. So together with the green the environmental organizations, we started fighting those real estate people. But the real estate people had much more power than we had together. They had influence with decision makers, with the power brokers, and the government, we felt during this planning process, when the final decision had to be made, in the planning process, we thought, this is going wrong. We do not succeed. We're going to lose this battle. We didn't know what to do. The Minister of the Environment at that time, Professor Judith Naot, who doesn't, doesn't live anymore in memoriam, we asked her, she was favorite, and we asked her, couldn't you bring maybe the Prime Minister? And somehow she succeeded. One day we were announced that the next day the Prime Minister would come to the mountain. We should be there. I asked if I could speak to him for five minutes. They said, okay. <laughs> there he came, busy. He was in a bad mood. And he came up the mountain, stood on the top right there, and he said, wow. This is absolutely wonderful. This is beautiful. What is it you want? And I told them what we want is to make a park and not to have building around here. And he said, okay, you've got it. <laughs> he said, make a government decision, he said to me. But I said, I don't know how to do that. He said, people will help you. So here, with a lot of luck, suddenly the government <coughs> before was against us suddenly helped us. And when this, these plans came before the National Planning Committee, which was the deciding committee, I was certainly not sure that the result would be favorable. But when I drove my little car to Geria, I suddenly heard on the news that the committee had decided unanimously to vote for a park and no building. And this was all the doing of the Prime Minister, Mr. Alex Sharon, who had a, a told each minister that he should not block the park. And this is how we were able to continue. But then I thought, I still wasn't satisfied. Because imagine this terrible environmental neglect will be covered by a beautiful park. Nobody will remember what it is. Something wrong with this. People will do it again. They will say, oh, great. We make a garbage mountain and we'll cover it with a park. <laughs> but then again, we were lucky. For some reason or other, 
The district planner told me that she was looking to place recycling factories somewhere. And I told her, why don't you bring those recycling factories and put them right at the bottom of the mouth? And just not put them in a regular way, but let them put them in such a way that the children can come and visit them and they can go from factory to factory and see how recycling is being done. And actually that is what happened. There are now already five, six recycling factories right at the bottom of Korea, one for building waste, one for green waste, one for household waste, one for plastic, one for cartons, and there will be even more. Then there was an old building that was on the point of being destroyed it had been part of a fertilizing plant. And it told them, don't destroy it. Let's make this into an educational center on recycling. And that's what happened. And we, the guidelines we gave to the architects was, everything in this building should be made out of recycled material. And you see the lamps are made out of bags, plastic bags, and the furniture, and everything is made out of old material. So that is now where we are today. We have this a, um, architect, the architect was, was chosen, he's from Germany, his name is Peter Latz, and he made a design in such a way that the profile of the mountain would remain intact uh, a little bit because he saw in it that it looked like an archaeological formation, like a tell we have in Israel. And there would be beautiful orchards around and a beautiful paradise garden on top. Already now it's open to the public. People can visit parts of it. Eventually it will take many, many years to build. We got the help of the government who took over and said, we will help you. We understood this is an important thing. And here I'm standing and I thought, what is really the conclusion of this story? It is that if you have a great dream and you have a little bit of luck and you have a little bit of persistence, you can change something ugly into something beautiful. Thank you very much.